All right. <clears throat> so we're going to get started on the budget public forum. So this is our first look at the proposed FY25 budget for the Granby Public Schools. We will um, we have a public hearing next week. Um, the public forum is right now it's that first look. Typically, there's not a whole lot of discussion or questions today. Obviously, I'm certainly open to trying to clarify things, um, but it gives people an idea of where we started, where we are, where we're going, the process that we've undergone to date, um, and the work that we've done and the work that we still have to do. Um, and I don't think I'm hiding or I don't think I'm sharing anything at a turn that there's still work to be done in the next few weeks before um, we have a balanced budget. But ultimately, the goal as of today is that the school committee will vote on a balanced budget. Likely at their April 9th meeting, we are, we've worked backwards from the May town meeting to make sure that all our dates and requirements line up with the May meeting. Um, I think this will be my seventh town meeting in Granby. I think only once was the budget voted on in the May meeting. It's been typically the June meeting. So we could have a little bit of leeway, but I think um, we want to make sure that we're working backwards from that first meeting. So uh, again, our strategic priorities have not changed. We um, had our 2023 to 2026 strategic plan approved last year uh, with these priorities, fostering strong and positive relationships, meeting the needs of all students, um, designing and developing powerful and engaging learning experiences for students, using relevant data in our decision making, um, welcoming, respecting and embracing diversity, providing training and support that connect to those strategic priorities, and a belief that everyone, staff, students, um, adults can grow and shift and succeed under the right conditions with the right supports. Our core values, again, these are things that we come back to often over the course of a year, um, be it when we're looking at attendance data or looking at um, grades, performance on assessments, things like that. We try to keep we try to make sure we keep our core values at the forefront of our mind. <laughs> so our FY25 budget objectives really haven't changed from FY24, FY23 for that matter. Um, but I do liken it to a teacher in a classroom that we set our objectives and we may not always meet those objectives of the day, of the week, of the month, quarter. Um, but that's what we're striving for. And, um, you know, there's a lot here, right? These are, while they're one line statements, there's, there's a lot held within them to consider providing the best for our students and teachers instead of always having to do the best with what we have. That's a big ask, right? Easy, small sentence in a way, but the, that takes a lot. Um, and, you know, we'll keep coming back to these objectives and uh, working towards them and thinking creatively and trying to be outside of the box in, in ways to continue to strive to get to those spaces. Similar to our objectives, our budget development, I think this line here, this best case scenario, uh, we have in the past had principals and uh, department head build their best case scenario. We talk about it as a wish list budget. What is everything you feel you need to thrive, right? This isn't just about surviving. How do you grow? How do you implement the programming that you want? Make sure you have all the supports. Um, unfortunately, in the past few years, the budget process has, you know, while well, we've gotten through it, it's been challenging. And we did back off of that a little bit this year and said, we don't want to build a full wish list because we've realized that's putting extra work on department heads and principals because we haven't gotten to all those wish list things. We did ask them to go above and beyond what is currently being offered. The reason for that is if they're identifying as, um, as necessary or 
needs to make improvements in either student outcomes or supporting teachers, whatever that may be. Um, tip, I always want to say that the challenge with any budget, but especially a school budget, is it's related. To, we're, we're, we're building a budget based completely on projections, and those projections change day to day. And I think people sometimes are like, yeah, of course they do. Like legitimately, the budget has changed four times since we started working on this presentation 10 days ago or so. Uh, little bits of information come in and that results in us changing something. A student moves into the district, a student moves out of the district, a student no longer has a one-to-one -one parent, right? All these things shift how the money that's approved. So it's difficult to say on Tuesday, March 26, 2024, what our students, what our staff is going to need on September 10th, 2024, or January 10th, 2025. But we're making our best good faith effort at that, and things do change um, throughout that process. So a little bit more on budget. I think if you're familiar with budgeting a little bit, you're probably familiar with the term level of service. Um, similar to what I was just saying, a level of service budget in schools is not always apples to apples for some of those those things that change, like not over the course of a year always, but based on, like I said, a student moving in, a student moving out, um, a teacher vacancy becoming open and the best candidate being at a higher step or a lower step than the person who was, who was previously in that position. All of that impacts our budget in some way or, or another. And a lot of those things are unknowns right now. But we started with a level service plus budget. So a level service is defined as taking this current year's level of services and projecting the same level of services for the next year, right? In some ways, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But we're talking about people, we're talking about students, we're talking about staffing, needs change, needs grow, needs shrink. Um, so we're using that term, but we recognize it's not just level service. It's not just rolling over our staffing from one year to the next. The reason we're saying level service plus is as a school, we're also required to pay for certain things, right? So an example in this year's budget is we got a letter from um, EPA a couple months ago about new water testing that they're going to be doing across the state, but the Grammy Public Schools is one of the places that would be impacted. And they said it could cost the district anything from $1,000 to $10,000. So we budget at $10,000, right? Because if it comes in at $1,000, we have some flexibility. If, it come, if we budget at $1,000, it comes in at $10,000, then we're taking from somewhere else that we had intended to spend. So we budget at the high rate. So that's a requirement. Um, student out of district tuition, student other services are required for any Granby resident uh, that we, those are costs that we must incur. So we built it there. So we started at level service. Um, and unfortunately, where we are now is still looking at a reduction, further reduction in services. I do want to remind folks that this was in FY24. So last year, we pushed through our budget process. This, these are cuts, these first four, these positions were cut last year. So that's a teacher, three teachers connected to the junior senior high school, further reduction in uh, special education related to the junior senior high school, band and instrumental teacher, which impacts both schools, a music teacher here at East Meadow was reduced, some contracted services related to special education services, an administrative assistant, and paraprofessionals were reduced, and some positions remained unfilled. So this is FY24. So when I talk about level service, these things are not part of that conversation. We haven't built any of these things back into the budget. Right? I think it's just important to emphasize where we've been a little bit as well. And how did we get here? 
right? There's a number of factors, a number of contributing factors. The few that I have listed here are not the only ones, but these are some. And I'll go through and explain what some of these things are in subsequent slides. We're a minimum aid district that is through the Student Opportunity Act. Um, to be honest, a lot of this is connected to the Student Opportunity Act. Um, so Governor Healy has promoted and touted, as she should, that more money is going into education than ever before, which is true, but it's not getting to places like Granby. And Granby's not alone. Granby is part of probably the two-thirds majority that's not seen a lot of the funds that are being doled out to the Student Opportunity Act. So we're a minimum aid district. Special education costs are rising. The, the rise in inflation, special education costs specifically, are far outpacing our ability to keep up with that with those things. Um, OSD, I will talk about OSD. I'll go to another slide before I get into it. And then inflation, right? I think we've talked, and if you watch the news, you see a lot about inflation. But there's some inflationary things in the Student Opportunity Act that has only broadened this gap for districts like Granby over the past few years. So what's a minimum aid district? Part of the Student Opportunity Act was that districts will be held harmless. They're not going to see funding reduced from one year to the next. And how the Student Opportunity Act proposes that we continue to see increases is they put a $30 minimum per pupil increase. The past two years that through the legislature and the final budget, that has been $60 per pupil. Um, so they've doubled it, which is helpful. But this number here, $19,650, that is our increase in state funding for FY25. So $19,000, that's $30 per pupil. That's what we're projecting right now. If it goes to that $60 per pupil, right, if we're doing the math, it's just a shade under $40,000, right? And that is the full increase that the state provides the district. Where I'm saying we're not alone is in FY25, we're, proj we're they're projecting Granby is one of 212 minimum aid districts. So 212 out of, I probably have this number off, but I think it's 317 districts in the Commonwealth, 212 of them will receive the $30 per pupil or $60 per pupil, whatever that works out to be. So, you know, in a way, we've been in a minimum aid district, but you can see the past two years, there's 70 more districts from two years ago and 90, 88 more districts from last year that are now minimum aid districts. Right. There's places like Pittsfield that has seen a $6 million deficit because they're no longer, they're now a minimum aid district after not being a district, right? If you're watching the news, so now there was out yesterday saying about 30 positions, Pittsfield's been saying about 100 positions and closing a school. So again, this is to just illustrate, this isn't a grand problem. I know this, that's also not a solution, but I think setting the context is important. The other thing around special education costs. Um, special education costs, be it out of district placements, transportation, services, um, finding qualified employees to, to provide the services that students need has become a bigger ask and is coming at a larger mm -hmm. cost um, than before. So this is our special education out of district tuition in FY22. We spent about 600,000. Next year, we're projecting about 1.6 million. Part of that comes from this OSD. So operational services, service division is an operation of the, is a branch of the government that sets the out of district tuition. They have to set it by, I think, it's, I think it's November 1st, they have to provide superintendents with what the rate increase would be for the subsequent year. Prior to FY24, that rate was increasing at about 2% per year. In FY24, it was increased by 14%. 
next year, another 4.6. So we're talking just shy of 20% over two years. But prior to that, to hit that 20% mark, it was taking closer to a decade. The impact in our budget this year is that's $170,000 that we did not have to spend on other services and other supports and personnel and supplies. Next year, we're projecting that number to be 320,000. So I'm not saying we're crying, but there's a little bit of spilt milk there when it comes to like, this is something that was handed to every district with no additional funding. Yes, there was a form of relief built into the legislature last year, but it, to be honest, it's not really relief. It's just paying ahead on money we would have received potentially next spring. Um, so those numbers are huge for us and numbers that we have limited control, if any. Inflationary trends, FY23, FY24. So the reason I bring this up, Student Opportunity Act also has a statutory, re not requirement, but legislators could have gone above it, but there is statutory language that says they would cap the inflation at four and a half percent, which they did in FY23, and they did again in FY24. In FY23, uh, we were closer to 7% inflation, and in FY24, we're closer to 8%. So that creates about a 6% gap in inflation that at this point will never be backfilled for any district. That gap will always exist. There is a push for legislators to include some language in to create essentially a new law that would start to backfill a little bit, but who knows if and when that would pass. When we met with legislators, this is part of our process, so we met with the town leadership, um, and Jen and Todd and I also met with uh, Senator Oliveira, Representatives Dome and Kerry, and we brought up this point exactly and said like in a year, but now it's 1.35. If you made that, if you brought it to 3%, that would make a difference and start to fill in that gap, right? Whether that happens or not, right? I think it was a pretty clever suggestion on our part, but whether that happens or not, like all we can do is advocate for that, but that would start to fill in some of this gap that's been created. So those are like the real, like some of the driving factors, the SOA stuff, and then some of these other things, high needs students, since pre-pandemic 2019, Grandview we've seen an 11% increase in high needs students, right? Students are high needs for a variety of reasons. And students who are high needs require typically more services and the costs increase to educate, be it through English as a second language or students and IEPs or students in challenging socioeconomic status, whatever it might be, there's different supports and um, approaches that make it more costly typically to educate. And that is a broad stroke. That's not every individual, but I think when you think of high needs, that's one of the budgetary impacts. Inflation, I, met, I mentioned transportation. This is a huge cost. Um, We've increased our transportation budget the past two years, and we're still going beyond, like, based on changes in students' IEPs, based on a number of factors, transportation continues to be bus. Transportation is voted in a different article in, in the town budget, but, right, it's still connected to us. So, like, I just want to make that point that the cost we're in the first year of a new contract for our general um, students coming to and from school on the first student buses or going to athletics and things. So we're in the first student. So we expected a bit of an increase here, but um, the impact is considerable. Special education, same, sim, similar. I talked about the 20% increase in out of district tuition and then outdated junior, senior high school. Um, 
And to be honest, we, we're incurring more costs in this building that we're now in year six. So certain things and systems start to require some more attention. And um, despite our best efforts around maintenance, certain things, right? There's wear and tear and there's things that need to be replaced over time. Um, so I think the junior senior high school is a bit of a different issue, but it's not like there's no cost associated here either. So this is a little bit about our outlook, $5,758 and a two and a quarter percent increase from year to year. And this is a sheet that we've used in the past that really just shows everything that I just went through. Chapter 70 is that state money required local contribution, additional town allocation. Again, this money would have to be approved at town meeting. Um, so this also isn't guaranteed. I should point out, I think if the finance committee were looking at this, they would say the deficit is 738,000 um, because the $600,000 would be included here. And we recognize that, um, but we have been in communication with town leadership, right? Like, so we're, we're taking the lead from them. Now, that's what I have for tonight. So, if committee has any questions, anything worth clarifying, I know we have a meeting, but I'm happy to. And again, I think I mentioned we do have public hearing next week. So, we'll continue to work on it. It'll be a similar but updated presentation next week. Um, and an opportunity to engage in some dialogue and answer some questions, but certainly happy to try to clarify anything. I can't, I don't personally have any, anything else to have any questions. No questions at this time. Really, it's very similar, you know, across the board for communities. It's not going to be an easy year at all. I mean, last year was a community year. Um, it's a lot of tough conversations and hard work. Yeah, yeah I think there's been times to your point, Joe, where I think Granby has felt alone in this. And I think this year, a lot of districts are feeling this much. Like I said before, we referenced a couple of like, the news coming out of our positions. And, you know, talking six or seven position versus another district talk about 30, but proportionately we look at I know it said open form, so I just had a uh, question. I sorry I came in a little late. So it's three percent um we had this slide up it's a two point two percent um, and 3.4%. So, um, if we were to, 2.2 would be, 2.2% would be, um, if we had to reduce, if we still have to reduce this whole, Nope, the reduction, the re this top number is where we are right now with the re proposed reductions and the $138,000 gap. So this is a bit, right, misleading. Like this is where we are right now with that $138,000 gap. And that's for the next fiscal year. Yeah, 25, yes. Don't swallow. Is that you're looking at the increase from twenty four? 
we're not alone with them. And I think difficult too, because these were cuts and reductions in FO24. Which remain in 20. Which remain out of our current budget. I just want to reinforce that. Yes. That they are still there with the potential of additional, you know, the yep. six or seven additional ones. Yep. And there's some things that we didn't mention in here that people, I think, recognize that we have contractually obligated increases, right? That get built into some of the increases that I said before at the schools, at the personnel level, like those happen annually. So, uh, yeah. Can you just clarify, so what would get us to the 2.22 percent? The 2.2 would be if we, the number that we've been told for, for now is we have to, re, we still have to reduce that 138,000. Reducing that 138,000 would bring us to that 2.2%. And then the number is based on the objects that you were given? Correct. And that's the same as about last year and the year before? Correct. So um, just a question, just something I've noticed. Um, every department in town goes up 3% for a COLA. Is the school not part of that? A 3% budget it increases every department town wide. So just something that I've noticed going through budget season and stuff. Yeah, and again, I don't know if, right? I think in some places, like, it's easy to say the numbers are the numbers. So. But I don't know if the town would look at it differently and look at just like the required local plus their allocate, right? Because we have state funding, we have offsets and things like that. So that's our whole budget. So I'm not saying that the town is or isn't giving us 3%. Um, like that we could probably run those numbers, but we haven't, we just looked at our total Budget. Yeah, and I was just thinking about it as far as how much money is being allocated to the school every year. It's up three percent. If you look at the numbers that you just had, they're three point four. That makes sense. That's what's happening departmental wide. So, this map right now. So this is the required town. So the required town allocation. So this is through the state funding formula. This went up to 249,000. This was a 4.4% increase. Then the in-kind went up also 180,000. Right, so essentially the difference between these two numbers would be what the town is increasing. And we've, we've had good dialogue with the town. I want to be clear, this is not a schools versus town initiative. Um, excellent, excellent. Like, please, it's Glenn and Chris have been phenomenal. And I think, Chad, our frustration point is that these things have happened to all districts and like without additional funding coming our way, OSD increases 20% in two years, right? Like those are things for a small district like Bramley, especially that doesn't generate a lot of revenue. I think I've heard 95% of the revenue in town was generated through residential taxes, right? Like I understand the challenges that come when it comes to like increased costs like this. Um, but I do also worry that there is potential that We'll continue to see those numbers grow because we may not be able to address certain needs when we would like to address them because of because we've been stressed so thin. You know, and I will also say, and then I'll step away for tonight, but we advocated when we met with our legislators for increased rural school funding. That would be huge. Like this 71,000 
is what we received with governor budget of 15 million last year. That's the same number in budget this year. But the Rural Schools Commission is saying $60 million needs to be in that line in order to fully school, fully support what rural schools need. And again, it's not as easy as just multiplying it by four, but for the purposes of this, I'll multiply it by four. That's 280,000. And that closes our gap and allows us to reduce the reductions and cuts that we've made. So that's what that's certainly one place. Circuit breaker is a really challenging formula to explain to people. But we're gonna see this number grow likely. It's definitely grown this year. We're gonna see it grow likely next year because we're spending more in these services, but you only get a percentage of a percentage back a year later. So it doesn't help us for the costs that we're incurring in the present. It does help us in the future a little bit, but it's not going to cover all the needs. So rural school funding, reinvesting circuit breaker at a hundred percent, like truly a hundred percent, because the way a circuit breaker is set up is. Essentially, if a student requires services over $50,000, then you start to get a percentage back starting at $50,001. You don't get $75,000 back. You get 75% of 50. So. You get third. So if you spend a thousand, hundred thousand dollars on a student in in the school year 24, 25, or 23-24, in the spring of 25, you'll get 37500 back. So it helps that it's a way, but it's doesn't keep up with the way that we're spending. It's a really difficult formula to explain in a way that I think people can capture it. So, so happy to take feedback um, between now and next Tuesday. Um, the number on the top is wrong. That number is correct. Um, but happy to take feedback and questions either from anyone here or the public between now and next week. And next Tuesday, we'll be back here at 6.30 for um, a budget hearing and certainly be open to answering questions at that point. Like I said, it probably is a pretty similar presentation, but we'll have made some changes that we made. Thank you so much for your time. Any refreshments? Share your refreshments, please. There are refreshments. Please. Thank you. That's good. Are you good? Today is Tuesday, March 26th, and the time is 7 p.m. And we'd like to start, uh, I'd like to call this meeting to order. First up on our agenda is our consent agenda. 
First is the minutes from March 12th. Any questions or comments on the minutes? Uh, hearing none, I'll make a motion. Make a motion to assume the minutes from March 12th. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Next is warrants 57 and 58. Aye. Signature. Any questions or comments on the warrants? Here, I'll take the motion. 57 and 58. Second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Next is visitors' comments. Any citizen wishing to speak before the committee must sign in with the administrative assistant prior to the opening of the regular session of the school committee. The visitor will identify themselves by name and address and shall speak for no longer than three minutes. For anyone unable to sign in ahead of time, you have to clearly state your name and address so that this information can be included in the record for the meeting. Did you sign in already? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I'll do the same here. I don't need my. You should. Thank you. You can come up here. Well, I need the desk. Yo, yep. Okay. I won't bite. She's like, this is practice. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Ready? Mm hmm. Okay. Right on the right side. Yep. Aldina Smith, 46 Easton Street. Committee members. A few days ago, when I sat to write this statement, I found that I was at a loss. That doesn't happen often to me, as I'm quite passionate about what I believe in. And above all, I try to look at problems in a big picture scenario. But with this, I just couldn't find the right words. It was quite daunting, to say the least. At the end of July, I sat in front of you and requested a conversation be started about the dual enrollment policy in our district and about opportunity. I thank you tonight that the conversation did start. And I hope after the presentation tonight, you can see how the definition of opportunity is embedded within the program. I envy the families that were able to take advantage of dual enrollment prior to the restrictions the district placed seven years ago. Many of their students earning up to an associate's degree by the time they graduated high school. What students were facing then looked completely different of what they are dealing with now. Just as we heard tonight, funding for education from all levels of government is subpar, to say the least. And just imagining what the snowball of that statement will be in the upcoming school year is truly terrifying. With that, the cost of college is astronomical. Colleges are now starting to not deny AP credit for certain fields. Passing exam scores listed for each college are all over the place. AP classes cannot be the only solution for students to meet their goals, as that may not be the best choice for them. Now more than ever is an opportune time to give students back the power to choose their path and take however many college classes they need to accomplish it. By removing the restrictions of the policy, students can choose courses that make a true impact for them, whatever their goal may be. Removing the restriction provides them with choices and opportunities. It can help students not feel the impact of budget cuts as badly, as if we cannot provide them with a class, it may be found across the different college curriculums. I have said it numerous times to many people, if we as a district have been able to prepare our students socially, emotionally, and academically to do well enough to be successful in college classes, we should be shouting out from our rooftops. It should be in every sentinel and every town reminder that our students have met their goals, they have overcome hurdles, and they persevered through their challenges. How can we as a district stand in their way, especially as it costs the district nothing? I think that's why it was so hard for me to think of the best words for this statement tonight. Even if it is for one student, or five, or 10, or 20, how can we stand in the way of whatever they need to do to meet their individual goals? How in the world can we do that to them? I leave that thought with you tonight, and thank you for your time. I do hate that we took this long to do. <clears throat> Any other um, visitors? Um, Crystal Dufresne, 11 Taylor Street. Um, I'm here um, with a couple questions. I did uh, watch your March 12th meeting um, for the school committee. And I guess 
really more of a statement. Um, as you guys are going to be looking at a new superintendent, I think it's really important to have a work group that reflects not only the parents, but the staff, as well as um, other um, aspects of the committee um, that you guys put together. But I think, I guess what I struggle with is transparency. It's really important to me moving forward. And I know you guys had talked about getting a third party, and I think a third party, I know it's going to be expensive. You guys had mentioned $10,000 or $13,000 for that third party. Um, and I know Mr. Durham also, um, you know, was in favor of that. And I think it's something that really needs to be considered moving forward because that's going to take a little bit of bias out of the whoever's on the committee on who comes forward as the interim um, superintendent. And I think that's what you guys were leaning for. We don't know if we're only, only for interim. Okay. So that, that from the meeting, it seemed like that's what you guys were leaning towards. And then you're going to um, figure out who or get a work group together. That was about the option. Months. That's one of the okay. options. It hasn't been decided. It's one of the things that we'll be talking about. Okay. Just, I know I'm not supposed to, but just to clarify yeah. that point, we have not decided if we're doing going in that direction. Okay. So whether it's the interim or it's a search committee for the superintendent position, I think it's just very important that there's transparency and that we're choosing or you guys are choosing someone that does not have already bias from the district. Um, so that's just something that other people have come to me. I have two boys in the district. My daughter's going to be coming up in two years. So it's just something that's very important to me. I do care about the future of the school district and what happens next. So just to be very transparent and open and look at all of your options. Excellent. Thank you. Apologies for stepping in there, Crystal, but I just wanted to know. Nope, that's okay. That's understood. Um, we have um, Cole here as our new student representative. Welcome, Cole. It's great to be here. I don't know if the same way. Nope. nope, you don't. We just did that for you. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Well, it's nice to meet all of you. My name is Cole. I am happy to be the new student representative for the school committee. Uh, it wasn't a very contentious election. <laughs> but, but I'm still happy to be here uh, with all of you reporting information from Ms. Jordan and Stacey Relay at the East Meadow School. So with that, I'll be pretty quick. I don't want to sound like a robot with this. Um, when I went and I spoke to Ms. Desjardins today, uh, actually in the last block of school, the first thing that became apparent to me was the sense of community she values. And that's not only community in and out of side of this building, but community in between both buildings. So from the high school to East Meadow. She talked about the, uh, excuse me. She talked about the talent show that was run by the sophomores. Ms. Jordan also mentioned that. It was held in the gymnasium here. She enjoyed that the, excuse me, that the students from both schools could come together and run a program that everybody could enjoy. Uh, additionally, the sophomores raised a good sum of money and the students here at this building were very happy. She detailed to me uh, general things going around in the school. Two MCAS pep rallies were held last Thursday uh, just to get the young students here minds off of MCAS and all the difficulties with that. I remember, of course, when I was little, I probably would have something like that. So I'm glad that they're doing that here now. Uh, students could earn to participate in events uh, and the better their grades, the more rewards. They had a parade around the school, I was told, where younger kids would go out and make posters uh, to support the older kids and their endeavors for the MCAS. Uh, Michael Swanigan from the high school was over here with the Rams costume to try and make it a little bit more fun for everybody. Uh, in terms of academic updates, four students won an MCAS award for excellence here in East Meadow. MCAS is starting next week. Of course, teachers are getting ready for that as they always will. Uh, student engagement. As I mentioned before, motivation was a big thing that I saw here. 
uh, for Ms. Desjardins, even uh, Mr. Rosenberg, I met him as well today, the assistant principal. Uh, Ms. Desjardins detailed to me the ST Math program, which they are currently in the process of running. Uh, they're running a March Mathness, uh, which is a program, or I should say, a little initiative put on by the school to give puzzles to students and then prizes for how many puzzles they can complete. They ran the bingo for books. I remember that one. I was, I was in trouble with that. They ran the bingos for books and also, as I mentioned, had the talent show. For support, different groups around the school, of course, after school programs. They just finished up around those uh, school sports clubs. They or I should say Ms. Desjardins detailed to me Girls on the Run, which is a program for girls to get a little bit more active um, running after school. She was very proud to say that the program is filled currently. And I was also detailed to mention something very important that Ms. Desjardins is uh, working on a grant for, for more after school activities. It's called 21st Century Activities. And she is looking for parents' inputs from around the school. Uh, this initiative she wants to get a grant for would help to start up new homework clubs after school uh, that involve math and ELA and helping students to overcome problems that they might have in school to give them a space to work with each other and work with maybe a um, tutor or such and such like that. As for the high school, I went and I spoke to Ms. Jordan about that. She did to, excuse me, she detailed to me the start of the spring sports season, of course. Games are expected to start this week. I believe there was a scrimmage for softball over there, actually, as we were talking. Um, it was very cold. <laughs> did they win? Um, when I left, they were tied. Oh, I'll hope for this one. Uh, the talent show, as I mentioned before, was put on by the class of 2026. It was held at East Meadow, and I thank Ms. Desjardins for that opportunity to for us to use their facilities. Um, academic updates, course recommendations went out to teachers last week. Students got their schedule and course selections yesterday. The high school will then start building schedules for the next year. MCAS starts very soon. In fact, it started today for 10th grade and it will start for junior high next week. Mr. Cree and the scheduling community, committee, excuse me, are working on a long block schedule for year 2026. The student voice group and others are helping with that design. Cindy Cusimo received the Superintendent's Excellence Award. She will be attending a ceremony dinner at Fiverr. Very excited for her. For school culture, uh, Nonprofit stuff like that. And Noah Chambers, who was our 351 ambassador, started the Cradles to Crayons uh, fundraiser, which takes used clothing or very gently worn clothing to charities. You can donate at both offices if you would like to participate in that. We are also working towards a lot more field trips for the future. I talked to Miss Jordan about how I personally enjoy field trips. I feel like I'm not alone in saying that. I think most kids do enjoy field trips and that is something that uh, we would like to work on. The career fair took place on the 13th. I thought it went very well. Ms. Jordan thought it went very well. There was a lot of student engagement. Uh, there was, I enjoyed personally that there was not just feedback of careers from typical, hey, medical, um, business, but there was also more blue collar work, uh, you know, construction, uh, paving, mining, if you really wanted to go down that route. Uh, I especially enjoyed that because that's a perspective that I feel students aren't usually exposed to too often. Future plans and goals. Uh, on April 5th, there is a, an emergency app. Students, students are getting trained to understand what the app is. I'm sure some of you know that is already, so I probably don't have to go into too much depth about that. But if you don't know what it is, uh, an emergency app 
was or is being tested for teachers to help assist in situations with the lockdown or shelter and teach or however that is. So uh, these students will be getting a little lecture to understand and recognize when that's happening. Uh, we booked an anti-bullying or digital skills presentation from the MARC organization. Uh, it is go it is looking right now like it's going to be for April 29th. The, I was detailed that the anti-Semitism assembly will be postponed until the fall. Uh, Ms. Jordan is working around the issue. If you have any questions, you can talk to her. Well We're glad to have the student voice back. Thanks so much. Good okay, to have you. Thank you so much. I appreciate You're, it. You are welcome to stay for as long as you want, but you may leave if you would like to. <laughs> Thank you so much for the opportunity. Appreciate it. See you next time. Okay. That's great, Mr. Me too. Okay, next on our agenda is the school committee reorganization. With um, 70 parents' departure, we have two, um, we need a new um, vice president, vice chair, vice president. I'm making sure I'm up now. <laughs> and also, we need um, to replace her on the um, subcommittee she was on. Uh, and I, she was on more than just community relations. Do you remember? Uh, Anyway, I know she, for sure she was on community relations. So um, we need a vice chair and um, a replacement of community relations. So does anyone want to throw their name in the ring to be vice chair? Keep in mind this will be from now. It's going to be you have to do it next step after that. You don't mind. Offering, I know I'm probably only here in May 20th. Um, but I if, said you said probably. Well, at this point, that's, too, that's what it is. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I don't mind uh, offering if others are not on the board of that. Hearing that, I will second that. All those in favor? Aye. Okay, you probably should have. No, I second. That was fine. <laughs> All right, so Jill will be vice chair. And community relations. Um, I don't mind stepping in uh, to that, and then it works because Mike and I will be on those two committees um, together. If no one has a problem with that, we don't have to vote on committees, it's just a volunteer for that. So. I'll put myself on that. Is there anything else that we need to reorganize? I don't think so. All right, that was easy. Done. Next is a um, statement of interest. So I think this, hope this is easy too. There is a template in the folder. In this folder? Yes. Oh, this is the thing. That serves as the motion. So the. Uh, Request of the committee would be to authorize me to submit a statement of interest to the Massachusetts School Building Authority um, this spring for a building project at Granby Junior Senior High School. We received the support of the select board at their meeting um, March 18th. Um, this submission, this authorization really only authorizes us to submit the application. It does not tie us to any funding. It does not mean we're invited in. This just keeps the opportunity open should there be an appetite for a project next door. So I read this and then someone uh, says, uh, so moved and then we second. All right, so I want to make sure I get it right. Resolved. Having convened in an open meeting on March 26, 2024, prior to the SOI submission closing date, the School Committee of Granby Mass, in accordance with its charter bylaws and ordinances, has voted to authorize the superintendent to submit the 
uh, submit to the Massachusetts School Building Authority the Statement of Interest form no later than April 12, 2024, for the Granby Junior Senior High School, located at 385 East State Street, Granby, Mass., which describes and explains the following deficiencies and the priority categories for which an application may be submitted to the Massachusetts School Building Authority in the future. Number five. Replacement, renovation, or modernization of school facility systems such as roofs, windows, boilers, <clears throat> excuse me, heating, and ventilation systems to increase energy conservation and decrease energy related cost in a school related costs in a school facility. Seven, replacement of or addition to obsolete buildings in order to provide for a full range of programs consistent with state and approved local requirements and hereby further specifically acknowledges that by submitting this statement of interest form, the Massachusetts School Building Authority in no way guarantees the acceptance or the approval of an application, the awarding of a grant, or any other funding commitment from the Massachusetts School Building Authority, or commits the Grandin Public School District to filing an application for funding with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. Someone say so. So, so moved. Can I have a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Thank you. So just so folks know that application approved by uh, Friday, April 12th. And this this is the last thing that we really needed is to your signatures and work with myself, you and Chris Martin to sign. Okay. All right. Next is the Student Opportunity Act. Student Opportunity Act. We're not a play today. Um, so I had included this in one of the school committee updates a couple of weeks ago. So by statute, essentially by law, um, we're, we're required to submit Student Opportunity Act plan and updates on that plan. Um, that is due to be submitted to DESE by April 1st. We have the plan ready to grow to go. We just need school committee approval. I will be honest, very honest, that Student Opportunity Act is where we get we're getting our state funding, $19,000. Um, while I understand the ask of DESE as it's mandated, so we will certainly comply. Um, a lot of these things are things that we will be working to do regardless of receiving that funding. I think in districts that are receiving millions of dollars in Student Opportunity Act, it's certainly important to track that and see how it is impacting student outcomes. Um, but for us, it is a minuscule amount. And if I'm being completely honest, we have built it into the work that we're doing regardless of that money or not. So our focus areas are supporting curriculum implementation to engage teachers in professional development linked directly to the illustrative math curriculum, uh, which is a curriculum we'll be introducing next year. Purchase illustrative math materials, supplement the wonders literacy curriculum for phonics and phonemic awareness and writing instruction, and set up a process to regular, regularly monitor the effectiveness of the curriculum implementation. The other evidence-based area that we selected was implementing high, lever, high leverage instructional practices to train staff and high leverage instructional practices designed to meet the needs of all students. For example, acceleration versus remediation providing scaffolded supports, explicit instruction, flexible, flexible grouping, adapting curriculum and tasks based on student-specific learning goals. With our target student groups, we need students with disabilities, low-income students. So, so we just need a vote to approve, to a school committee vote to approve the plan, and then we'll submit it. And I have a motion. Make the motion to approve the Grammy Public School Students Opportunity Act plan for the 25 through 27. Can I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, next, salary adjustment from fiscal year 23. 
Um, through an audit with MTRS, it was found that we had a staff member in, 20, in FY23 on the wrong step. The adjustment um, is $3,475.14 uh, to uh, correct that uh, step error. Can you Oh, say the amount again, I'm sorry. It's $3,475.14. And this was, this is just one person? Uh, I mean, yes, a single individual. And do we think there are any others that are working? No. Uh, any other questions or comments on that? Hearing none, I'll take the motion. I'll make a motion to approve the salary adjustment from fiscal year 20 group. I have a second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Next up is a trip to Brownstone. Okay, do you have a pause? Yeah. Okay. Do you want me to stop that right now? Get to it. There's one over there. Oh, there we go. So, Crystal Dufresne, teacher at the high school. I am the class um, advisor to the class of 2027. Um, they have voice to me that they um, are feeling a lack of community, that they want to do something together as a class. So um, the class officers did some research. We looked at different areas that we can go on a class field trip, um, and they came up with Brownstone Park. It is a water park, um, you swim to everything. Um, and they have zip lines, they have cliff jumps, they have a, a water slide for the kids too. Um, I put on the sheet the rate at which they would charge a large group. Um, so it's a 10% discount for the adventure pass, which is $44.10 per student. Um, I didn't put any busing to be on there because I haven't, I, one, I didn't know if this was gonna be approved, and two, I was hoping to use the yellow bus program. There's only 41 students in that class, so we would all be able to fit on one bus. If they want to do team building activities, which is definitely an option, it would be an additional cost of $15 around. Um, again, I didn't put that on here because I wasn't sure if it was going to be approved or not and if I should be for it with it. Um, so I told them I would come and represent the class and see what the school committee thought. So if you have any questions, I'll definitely answer them. Um, I'm just listening to what the students want. But thank you. Just so the committee knows the reason this is coming before you is it's an out of state brownstone in Connecticut. Uh, the school committee must approve a CC based out of state or overlay of teacher. Uh, I think it's um, serendipitous because, oh, it's just here talking about how students want to have um, the, the field trips and stuff. So it does offer like team building as far as kayaking. Um, the kids were blindfolded kayaking, which was interesting to read about. Um, and there's another one with different water obstacles and stuff like that that students can choose or not choose to do. So we're not gonna force anyone to do anything. It's their choice that they want to do. Um, so um, does anyone have any questions? Maybe the uh, adventure sports one. It would be the adventure pass, yes. So the only thing that that would exclude them from is the wakeboarding. That is an additional cost. So a lot of them. I've done several times actually with my boys, um, and they love it. We go every year at least once. It's amazing. It's yeah. so fun. So, and are you going to be leading chaperones? So um, if, according to the group, they give you, uh, for every 15 students, they give you one free chaperone to go where they roll it into the package for the group break. Um, so yes, we are going to be meeting chaperones. I know it's towards the end of the year, so I was going to leave Ms. Jordan to uh, let me know if she wants parents, teachers, or what have you. Um, so that would be between Ms. Jordan and Mr. Rodriguez. Just throw them in out there. But it's worth it. <laughs> um, well, and as far as lunch, so I did think about lunch. Um, they can bring their own, and I can have a cooler that they can put it into. I was definitely going to get at least 
to um, Panicas of Water is they have like a little beach area where you can roll your stuff into and then you can set up on the beach. I am not for buying a gazebo there. It's very expensive. It's, I think it's like three or four hundred dollars to get one of the bigger gazebos that float on the water. So we would probably be setting up on the beach area that they have there. Um, and I thought about just like the last field trip that I took to um, the body world. The cafeteria is willing to pack them a lunch and do a bag of lunch that they can also bring with them as well. I would just have to let them know that against how many I need. Um, and they do have the option to purchase lunch there as well. So there's definitely um, options for them. Any other questions? Hearing yeah. none, I will take the motion. Would be a motion to accept the trip to Brownstone. Yes. Yes, I'll make a motion to accept the trip to Brownstone. I have a second. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I'm so excited for them. That's really great. And next is another field trip. Um, trip to Sunny's place. Let's see. I actually have to see lower than your presentation form. Can you get refresh it? Just to see if that So hello everyone, Allison Jordan, building principal at the high school, junior high school. I'm here to present another field trip. Um, this one is for the junior high, grades seven and eight. And Mr. Sibla, who was the team leader for the junior high, is not in attendance tonight, but we've been collaborating on this. Um, it is coming before you today because it is, as state, it is in Connecticut, it's Summers, very similar to Brownstone. It's just, um, it's Sunny's. I did put a link in the bottom for you to uh, navigate around the website. You'll find that you'll look at it and smile because you'll want to be there participating in all the events. They do have school pricing. Um, yeah, the school pricing can range from hours. So it could be two hours, three hours, four hours. So I included that information in here. And the transportation fees would be 400 per bus. We'd be taking two buses. My plan was to seek approval first before proceeding with any other steps. I do have two buses on hold with the bus company. Um, but in regards to next steps, we'll be contacting the PTO to see if they can help offset some of the transportation costs as they did last year. Um, so the um, cost for the students is kind of to be determined right now. I do feel like two hours would be enough time spending there for $25. Um, so it would either be $30 or $35. Um, and if students are experiencing a financial hardship with family, they can certainly reach out and we can help um, facilitate a path to support them in attendance. I did drop in as well a letter that would be sent out to families um, at the bottom under additional links and as well as the flyer that includes the prices. Also added in the standards, it was asked, you know, how this field trip and supports the standard. So as a prior PE and health teacher, that was easy for me because we, we were always going on field trips. So it supports physical activity and fitness mental and emotional health and healthy relationships and personal safety. Um, so really the whole student and not just for the students, for the staff, for the staff to also be in attendance. I felt choosing signing was a good um, option as opposed to Six Flags um, with the black top at Six Flags. It can be really warm and hot. So trying to consider the staff and it's easier to manage groups of students at Sunny's versus at Six Flags, right? There's a little bit more room to um, expand at Six Flags and felt Sunny's would be more appropriate for our students in grades seven and eight. Uh, we would be asking that all team members attend. So it would be all grades seven and eight teachers as well as an administrator and possibly a school nurse. Uh, the plan for food, while they do offer options for food, we were going to reach out to Chart Falls for a bag of lunch and possibly stop somewhere along the way. There's lots of fields 
possibly hang out under a tree and just consume our lunch that we don't allow food on grounds there if it's not being purchased from Sunny's. But students can bring cash. They have nice ice cream area and a nice little setup there. So it's super cool that they've expanded all their activities. So there's bumper, there's like the bumper cars or like the race cars. There's a zip line. I forget what it's called, like Soaring Eagle or something. Climbing wall, carousel. So their pass would get them access to all the things that are listed in the flyer. Any questions or comments? Hearing none, I'll make the motion. We'll make the motion to approve the junior high trip to Sunny's place. Can I have a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Dual enrollment in early college. There is not a vote listed on this. Is that accurate? That is accurate. So um, we do, you do have a proposal in the folder, but it's never as easy as it seems. Um, so I did reach out to our attorney about policy versus procedures. We've had some of that conversation with the policy subcommittee in the, over the past year. Um, and our attorney suggested a policy, which I have shared with the policy subcommittee who meet tonight. Um, and she suggested if the committee were to adopt that policy, then the document that's in your folder would be more procedural. So similar to similar to what we've done with field trips, saying this is the policy, superintendent build, building administration has the purview to work within that by setting up some guidelines. Um, so that is a little bit of a change from what we've done in the past because in the past we've referred to this more procedural approach to, as policy. So you'll see it's dual enrollment, early college guidelines. It covers a lot of what is in the proposed potential policy and then also um, delineates the guidelines throughout. So. Um, I'm seeing an edit that needs to be made still in there based on a comment. So this was not developed by me alone. Um, yeah, do you see uh, item yeah. three under guidelines? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, Mrs. Smith, who spoke earlier, has been part of a work group that we've been working. I don't know if it's been since October or November, um, but we've had four or five at least hour long meetings. We've looked at everything from advanced placement acceptance scores to articulation agreements to um, National Honor Society bylaws and looked at taking a really comprehensive look um, at what other schools are doing that are connected to dual enrollment in early college, what our current policy looks like, where it could be tweaked and um, based on the input of that work group, we've made adjustments to the current guidelines. Um, this is more of an up-to-date version. I'm happy to, if it would be helpful for the committee to show where changes would be made for the next meeting, but just wanted to bring it to your attention tonight. My thought is if the policy subcommittee supports the policy, that that could be voted on at our next meeting. If that's voted on, we wouldn't require a further vote to implement these guidelines. So what is I mean, we've had dual enrollment for a while in various iterations. Mm -hmm. What is different here than what happened for a class of 2023? Right. So that's where I could go through. I could show you the side by side documents for the next one. But um, for our next meeting, <laughs> there's a number of differences in here. Uh, one of the ideas around early college and dual enrollment statewide is making sure that there's equitable access. So we have proposed, proposed potentially reducing the GPA required from a 3.0 to a 2.0, but that also means those students need to meet the requirements of the higher, the institution of higher education, likely pass the ACCUPLACER that would qualify them to participate in dual enrollment through that um, organization. 
we have had a cap on the number of students, number of classes students could take. That cap is not in this proposal. Um, trying to think of other. I have a question for the committee. I have some questions based on what um, Mrs. Smith was talking to us about. So I'm um, asking the committee if they're okay to have her back uh, to ask a few questions based on her statement and the fact she was on the committee. Yeah, of course. Do you mind? Or would you, you can answer from there if you'd like, if you're more comfortable. Well, I, I don't mind. Are you okay with that? Of course. So based on your statement, to me, it kind of came across as negative for dual enrollment. Oh, gosh, no. So oh. uh, what what we offer as negative, like we don't. Oh, I think dual enrollment has benefits. Um, you know, this, absolutely. This, this notion of AP courses can be limited. You know, not I mean, right now. I'm actively. I was an admission counselor for two years at a private, you know, college. So you know, there's a lot of steps when after someone applies to college and it goes off to the colleges and the different institutions. Um, AP courses aren't just threes anymore that you can get. They have. So many colleges are fours and fives, so threes aren't good enough for them. I mean, there's no standard across the board. Additionally, a lot of what's happening now is, for instance, if you're going to a medical field and you take AP anatomy and physiology or AP biology, you get a five, highest you can get. They will not take it. Uh, oh, I, I, I 100 percent. So what, that's where I'm confused with your statement because we we do offer AP courses. I also know our guidance department is is pretty great. And I know that they have conversations with a lot of those students as they're going through and doing that. And I know, you know, I, I just live through it. Right. So, and then as the students are doing their research, they decide whether or not they're gonna take an AP class or go for a dual enrollment class. Um, and it depends upon what you want. Some kids wanna take the AP class because they wanna have that ex um, higher level of class. So they're prepared going into a college level class. Um, because they're, it, then the information's not going to be foreign. Other kids decide they're not going to take an AP class. They're going to take a dual enrollment class because that way they're learning the information for the first time the way the professor at the college wants to teach it. Right. So I just wanted, I guess my thing is, I wasn't sure where you, what you were trying to convey to us. That's okay. So my message is by limiting it to two in the situation that the district is in, it's challenging because sometimes it's three to make that kid's path meet their goals. Sometimes it's four, sometimes it's five. Okay. So for example, we had this massive STEM initiative years ago and we have no AP physics and no AP chemistry. So if you take biology or a ninth grade science, then you go into chemistry 10th grade and then you go into your physics 11th grade, what do you take, what do you take senior year? No science. What if you are a, you did your AP coursework, um, your uh, enrollment into AP history and AP English, you did all your junior year, what do you take senior year? You know, my son's living it, he's a dual enrollment student. student. By the end of this year, his junior year, he'll completed 23 college credits. He has a 4.4 GPA, 4.44 GPA at the high school, he has a 4.0 HCC. He can do more. He wants to do more, but he cannot. So next year, he's currently scheduled in an English honors class. He's scheduled in a Spanish honors class and wealth classes. So there isn't anything else for him. So that's the difficulty of the whole situation. It gives one student is not the same as another student. What is great for one student going to physical therapy is not the same as one person going to mechanical engineering. There are districts in the area that offer intro to engineering as an elective senior year. Our students do not have that. So if you can only limit two, how, what if three was better for their, for their goal? By causing a restriction, it makes it, or giving them a restriction, it makes them limited when you stand in the way of them meeting their cap. Okay, so it was mostly about the cap. Yes. No, okay. No, that's the program's cool. fabulous. And I think what also is, is about funding. When you are a dual enrollment student, there are, you cannot apply for FAFSA. So that's a funding issue. But HCC allows the dual enrollment students to apply for their scholarship. 
So if you have low income, if you need special services, there are scholarships available to those students. And all you do is fill out your application, write your essay, and you're put into this pool with $300,000 in the scholarships. You find which ones match, and then they can contact the student. So that's funding that we don't have to provide as a district to them. You can go to one free course at HCC, one free course at Elms, one free course at Westfield State. Now you have three of five full, a full semester being five, you have three free courses. If you can get scholarships for other two, you see students that may not have had the means to go to college, now possibly have a free associate's degree. Just opportunities that have to be taken advantage of because of the times that we're in. Okay. Well, thank you for that clarification. Does anyone else have any clarifying questions on her statement? Okay. Thanks for that, Dana. I appreciate it. So what we you had just said, Stephen, though, that we're Say we're going to talk about that. The policy committee is going to talk about that, about the cap. So so the, in, well, actually, so what's in front of you would be the guidelines. Okay. So those would not be what the school committee would vote on. The school committee, if the subcommittee supports it, would be voting on a dual enrollment policy, which is similar to our other policies that it yeah and essentially it does the same thing as the field trip piece too yes. like it allows for the procedures to be set and determined by the superintendent and administration okay. whereas the policy allows for dual enrollment got it thank you right and i mentioned in the budget presentation innovation career pathway there's also an early college designation through desi this could set us up to pursue that which also comes with additional funding potentially excellent Okay, so we will have this again um, next next time. I don't know that it's next week. Is it not a regular two, two, two weeks. weeks? Yeah, April ninth, and that will potentially be for a vote for the policy. Correct. Okay. All right. Um, next is continued uh, continued visit. Continued business, superintendent search. So we did include a copy of the superintendent, the flyer of the superintendent search. I don't know if Todd wants to speak to it, but I think this is what the uh, quote unquote postings for superintendent jobs look like if you look at MASC um, and such. So there would have certainly have to be some updates. So we wanted to put those things in here, put this in here so people could make suggestions. Um, again, really, it's a committee decision, but I think my personal feeling would be to get a posting up there sooner than later to see what kind of pool is available. Um, whether can that be do, interim or long term, or can we do first question? And I apologize for not remembering, but oh, it didn't matter last time, I guess. Do we can we do a posting? Um, gosh darn it. Without knowing if it's in interim or um full at that time so it's is it an interim position or a full to position? determining if you are looking for an interim or permanent effective as job effective july 1st 2024 so i guess we should back it up to that we need to decide what we're all thinking and if we want to go with interim or um Take a shot in the dark and get um, a full superintendent because we're gonna, if we go with interim, then we're going to have to have a, a secondary um, search. And I don't know if we can run them concurrently because we held the interim rate for a year or however long. It could be more than one year. The interim could also turn into your permit. So, tend to hire. <laughs> 
Mm-hmm. Is that the right? Jane. Yeah. Huh. Like the association we'd like to um, have a certain fee search done. Okay. How do you all feel, my committee? I think three months to find a permanent is tight. I think interim is the way to go, and then take our time running the thorough process to find a permanent. Not that the interim won't be thorough, it's just we'll have more time to expand upon the areas that we need to. George? Let's engage with that as far as <clears throat> giving the timelines. Sure. I'm really concerned about the timelines. I feel like when there was an interim in the past, there was that ability to thoughtfully give time for a search committee, plan what those was. I mean, no people can speak to it, but the difficulty in getting 17 people's schedules to align to do all the things that we needed to do and communicate with Tracy in between on each step of the way because there was no one supporting and managing mm-hmm. that overall piece to make sure procedurally we were meeting things where we needed to. It, it was a real heavy lift. And I know it was a heavy lift on all the, the administrative staff that was here too. So while I appreciate the want for like some permanency and stability, I'm really concerned about the time frame. So question though, um, for the record, my gut is I would like to go for a full rather than having to pay for something twice. Um, I am concerned about the timelines, but what I'm wondering is if, do we know if we paid MASK or NASBO or whoever to do that, does some of that work become come off of our plates? Do we need to have as large of a committee I, I, so that's where I'm, I'm, not, I'm not certain on how, what, if we say we hire them, what does that mean? You know, I don't want to pay, like to me, what we just talked about, getting 17 people's schedules coordinated is a daunting task in and of itself. But if we hire math, do we need a 17 person committee still? Is the work, what the committee doing less that we could, to, yeah, I'd probably just a little bit. Um, when you, so at the time when we decided to go on our own because of the cost, right? We mm-hmm. facilitate that. So you're paying for their services. So they um, were part of the process, but a lot of the heavy lifting is done through them. Right. So, yes, to answer your question, it's going to be smaller. Okay. Right. So at the time, putting 17 people, but it still includes stakeholders across the district in various roles and community, et cetera. Um, I do, I, like, I hear the union perspective, but I also, to put it in perspective, there's nine weeks for the two week posting at seven weeks, and you're at the end of the school year. So seven weeks to find, right? So that is a big lift because to ask, um, people for committee members to try to put forth someone and when we did this the last time we had someone that was within district we had two internal candidates that were able to interview for the interim position and i don't believe we are in the position that we have anybody in the district that is a licensed to be interested you got licensed candidate candidates but those like uninterested so um you don't necessarily have to use if you were choosing to go the route of an interim you wouldn't necessarily have to use MASC in that capacity to form a committee to do a search and then essentially do it twice if you were having the targeted search for an interim versus what you would look for in the in a full permanent search. I just don't see how we get out of doing the search twice. Because you don't you are going to do the search twice. It's to what degree you're doing that search. And how if you're doing the full search, I, I've been on a full superintendent search committee 
the net was cast nationally, internationally. That process is going to take much longer than the time frame. So if we are going to truncate this to a seven or rest week process, we can't cast a wide net. So that's where the interim is not casting as wider than that in order to be able to do the thorough search for the permanent position. So I feel like I still wanted to I don't want to just have anybody for the interim. Like, I still want to have a good, somebody good, right? Like good, I, good candidates are out there okay. for a, an interim position. It's, it's not, That's we, don't have to, we don't have to anticipate this someone who has just gotten their license and, hey, I'm going to get my feet wet in an interim and and get myself as a springboard to somewhere else. We can, it can, the committee can make that the, the criteria that is someone who is going to meet the needs of Granby to help us transition in this process. Okay, so I guess our first um, part of our vote here for superintendent search is are we ready to make a decision if we're going interim or if we're going full search? I think we have to make that decision. Right. And it becomes, you know, how those next pieces of it. Okay, so I will take a motion for superintendent search. I'll make a motion that we move forward in the superintendent search on um, looking at an interim superintendent candidate. Can I have a second? A second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Okay, um, for the record, I, I still would, what I'm trying to say is I would want the just the one search. So we're going to go for interim. So now our next steps is we need to, um, it's multiple, multiple prongs, right? We need to get um, a committee. So we need to get the word out. Can we get that in the newsletters for this week? Um, anyone watching get names back to Jackie? Today is the 26th. Um, newsletters go out on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, sometimes over the weekend. Friday to Sunday. Um, so do we think a week is enough time to get names back? Given the compressed timeline, that's... I feel like we need to kind of... Them. So we want to have names back by next week, which is the 5th, I think. Is it the 5th? By April 5th. We can send out a connected. Okay. There's a loan. Um, connected. Um, and people, um, you know, if anyone has any questions, they can reach out, but please help, help us spread the word. We need to do that. Um, Allie, could you read that list of people again? So we make sure we get the right stakeholders. Thank you. Uh, school administrator, district administrator, school committee, GEA. How many GEA? One or two? There was one. School committee was two? Yep. District administrator, there were two. One school administrator, there were one. Jill, you were a two person? Mm -hmm. Two. It looked like two parents from each building. And we rounded up on that so There were four, not five. Uh, it looked like a teacher, two representatives from East Meadow, two from the high school, and two community. Well, community member was a select board member at the time. Okay. Thank you. So if anyone is interested and falls within one of those categories, um, please get your name in to Jackie by next Friday, which is April 5th. And then we need to um, our, we need to decide if we're going to do the interim search ourselves or if we're going to um, talk to MASC to help us 
Um, in MASC, Kimberly did say we likely have a list of potential interns without mm -hmm. potentially without a cost. Okay. Um, and just my recommendation, you guys can certainly take it or leave it, would be to get the posting up as soon as possible. Yeah. Before next Friday, certainly. All right, so we need to, there's, um, so we would amend the posting with the timeline because it was, the, the timeline was part of the posting the last time. So I do think, I do think the initial time frame was just when the posting closed when there were like TBD dates down the side until the committee, the search committee was formed. Okay. Yeah, oh, I, yeah, I have it. All right, so um, we should get a new superintendent search for 2024, right? Yeah, I think even the first page is probably sufficient for a posting. Are we comfortable with the salary listed for um, a interim position? In tab of the current salary was what was budgeted, so mm -hmm. we're within the realm. Yeah. Okay, great. So I guess that that part is fine. Um, and the three-year contract part would have to be amended because it would be for interim. That's where we would say it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we probably would say in the first invitation to apply for interim superintendent to bring folks to the right at the time. Okay. So second part of our vote, um, do we want to um, just ask MASC for the list of names with potentially no cost, or do we want to partner with them uh, for the cost? And if we, we can't, it has to go out to bid. It's not something we can decide. We have to go out. We have to do a formal bid process. Isn't that weeks long? So she said it's a request okay. for quotes. Which is, yes. which is a, it, um, it has to go out and be publicized, whether that's through combines or one of the other platforms um so it's it's not a simple letter that goes out to doesn't it's i'm just based on what i'm hearing it doesn't sound like that's the approach that you're leaning towards it's more the second bullet where she says committee decides they do not want to request codes and would like to do an internal search on their own i believe masc still has some services that are available because i think if we want to do this we can't even post it until we have that authority because if we go with MASC they're going to you know like don't they we can post it without having to use MASC's platform if the committee chooses to go forward with MASC or another vendor it would then be supplemental to our original posting so if we um, do this when for the posting, it was open for two weeks last time. Uh, uh, actually, it was longer than that. It was a much longer time frame. Um, we should have the information back to be able to make a decision, even though after we post this is what I'm understanding. Yeah. Can you rephrase that? Yes. Well, I'm thinking if we, what I'm worried about is we're going to post this, but we don't know how we're going to run the search. Because when we had this before, we had already partnered right. with MASC. They collected all the applications. If we post this now, yeah. they're coming to us. Correct. We don't want to just have them sit there to not do anything with them until we make a decision. Right? That's that's where I'm hung up. So I feel like we can't actually move forward on posting this until we know if we are going with MASC. And we can't do that until we have quotes. We can't get the quotes for another, another couple of weeks. Right? It sounds to me that you're not going in that direction. It sounds to me like you guys are deciding you're running 
your own search by posting and then reaching out to MS, MASC for their list of available interns. I think that's what my thought process was around the interim path is that you wouldn't do the full search and look at all of the services attached to that until like for the interim, like you would be potentially doing that, but you might not have to, if you have all that time to plan and kind of be thoughtful about what that looks like again. But I think that gives So that's my apology. I thought we still had to do a search for the interim. That's why I kept saying, because I don't think we can you just are doing a search, but you have the option of not using an outside service to run that search. Okay. Well, so bottom line, we still need to have a committee in whatever size for interim. Do we need this large of a, com a committee for an interim superintendent then? I still think you want representation from, you know, a variety of stakeholders in the committee. Um, what I do not recall what the last time is mass holding the applications. I thought they came directly to the school. They did some initial leading. I remember that. Okay. I remember that we had when, um, cause I sat in on the first round of stuff and it, they had sent us these, here's the first. Of okay, everyone who's qualified. Qualified. So they did okay. the original search. So if we're not going to use them at all, and we're going to do that, that means that committee is going to be doing all of the screening. Yes. Yeah, I remember being privy to the names or anything until that we got like a bunch of like, here's our first round of people for you. And then we did salary, uh, not salary, sorry, um, our own resume screening, because I sat in on those first ones. And then I had to step in. That's when Emery left. Mm -hmm. So I had to recuse myself because I couldn't be on as the chair. Yeah, there's agenda agendas for all seven of the meetings mm -hmm. throughout the whole entire search in one of those folders. But yeah, they kept the applications and then I remember I remember them and sharing it and that's going through it. But they vetted. Right. So they did the vetting, but that's because we had already reached out to them and made that partnership. And so for interim, we did not, it was in a completely inter internal process. Yeah. Is it possible to ask them if they can help us with the interim as well as the full search? Oh, I'm sure they'll say yes. And it's just, we'll just be pay paying for it both. And that extent that goes out to that RFQ process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's happened to us before, but you. Judy was an intern. Well, she was always. She didn't intern. become. She was always intern. She just reacted. Yeah. Just an, it was extended. Oh, it extended. Because we didn't have a viable search, gotcha. as I understand. Gotcha. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. I think the section under on the flyer where it talks about the application process, right? That's the big difference. Is they application would go to them. Or they go through. That doesn't mean it's not okay to have over a type process if you're not going through them. Right. No, that's I'm the, that's what I that's where I'm hung up is that I'm thinking even if we're talking about doing we voted that we're going to do an interim search. Fine. What we need to not decide now is if we are going. Like this, we, you know, we had, the, I don't care where the applications go. They can go to my mailbox for all I care. Like it's, it's fine. But that we down that committee has a whole nother step work of work because they're going to be vetting every application that comes through. But we are at the point now, as I'm understanding it, that we cannot even have them sent to MASC because we have not reached out. And that's the quote process. So if that, that's, do, are we deciding that then we're going to do our own internal process, which we really can't decide, well, we can do that, but we, we. If, if we, I'm sorry to interrupt. If no, we use a platform like SchoolSpring that we do for many of our other postings, it will collect and it'll hold all the applications, all the information uh, for the candidates related to that search. It becomes a storehouse. It's doing, the only thing it's not doing that MAC might do is we have, if someone doesn't have the license or doesn't meet 
a specific criteria committee has determined. Right. No, no, I, I'm, I'm on that. It becomes a platform. For, and if the committee determines someone in the central office, whether it was me or somebody else, receives <clears> and, <throat> you know, acknowledges the receipt of these things, we can do it <clears> that way as well. But it said school spring will, that's a function of school spring. Okay, great. So school spring, are we good with school spring then? Yes, sounds good. Jill? Well, I guess I'm just going back to the question about I don't believe there was a cost associated with using masks the way we did the last time. There was. It was like $5,000. It was small, but they also posted it, right? Because they can post on the MASC. So what they did was vet and then collect and vet mm -hmm. and then gave it to us. Well, I so, believe MASC will still post it on their website, even if it's posted through school spring for us. So certainly you can post it on school spring. That seems that seems fine. It's the vetting process. And we don't have a committee yet. So um we're gonna send out that notice this weekend and then gather the names and then have them um summarized by the fifth, right? So we'll have a committee within seven days. Hopefully if we get people interested. And then we'll lock in another meeting on the ninth and start scrubbing the applications received as they come in. Committee will, right, the committee will receive, once it's closed, the committee will receive the applications. Because we, can't, committee. we can't go through them until the application period's um, closed, right? Yeah, okay, so. Okay. I apologize for being dense, I'm just not. Um... Oh, it's, it's actually helpful. Yeah, there's a lot going on. And if I could, again, like, my thought would be, Post it while you're simultaneously trying to get your committee. You could have the whole committee or a subcommittee of that committee screen the applicants, identify the number that you want to interview. You could do private interviews for that and then request two or three or four, however many the committee wants, recommended as finalists. Those, my understanding, would have to be public interviews at an open meeting, and then the committee would deliberate and make a decision. Mm -hmm. So we could capture that. You could send it to the attorney to make sure that lines up with everything that we need to do in terms of process. But I think some of those things can happen simultaneously. Sounds good. So we need to decide for today when we want to target getting the app, the posting out and when we want it due, because those are the two dates that need to be on there and the rest can be filled in as we, um, after the committee is filled hopefully by the ninth. So application, when do, um, we can take a few minutes in a moment to look at the rest of the flyer, but what do you all think? Do we wanna to try to have that out by next Friday as well, by April 5th? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a viable target. I do think really you're looking at changing the application process in terms of taking out the information about mask and noting mm -hmm. like where to apply in those pieces. The dates will just go and be TBD based yep. on our our initial date. Um, the only piece on the timeline too that I'm wondering about is that if we're looking at an interim candidate, they may not currently be at a site. And so I know we had done some site visits or um, we virtual do, at that we point. We didn't do those for the interim. So I don't know if we need to do a right. site. But I, I don't yeah. think you, you may not be able to, mm -hmm. you know, if they're retired, you know, who knows who's coming forward. So that's a piece that we may want to consider taking out of the timeline. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, with the application due, the semifinalists selected, the interviews, the finalists announced the finalist interviews, and then the selection. Um, I think all those are still. Can we do site visit as needed? Well, I just don't, to me, do even need them. I don't know that we need them if they're you know, you're talking about the equity of it. And if people aren't currently working in a district or have stepped away at the end of a school year or something and may be interested, um, you're not traveling to a site. Right. I'm fine with that. How do you all feel about no site visits? You know, it should be fine unless we see there's any reason otherwise. <clears throat> um, so when do we want to have the application due? If we start at April 5th, Um, that's a week from Friday. Do we want to try to have the application due by the 30th? I mean, it's interim. Do we need to have it open for six weeks? 
the other thing I'll just say, if you guys settle on the posting tonight, we can have it posted tomorrow. Okay. Do you guys want to try to bang out um, getting the posting done then? <clears throat> Excuse me. And again, I think if page mm -hmm. one stays, I mean, it might require some updates, but some edits, but not much. I mean, then timelines, TBD, application process, everything down below isn't going to change. Is someone, do, do we want to have one person in charge of cap, capturing? Mm -hmm. I can do it. Thanks, Joe. Are we going, are we adding interim? Yes. It's going to screw it all up. <laughs> Wait, I think we're going to screw it. I don't know. Where did the rest of it go? I only really have inter intern superintendent. Oh, it went off the page. This is what I mean. It's like a whole the text block. Oh, that's why. Oh, it's up on the top of the next page. Mm -hmm. But I can at least go through and take out these things. I'm going to ask for assistance real quick. Generally assist too, so you can at least reach out to them and just get mm. guidelines to consider. Sure. I'll be with informational resource. Yeah, because last time we just had constant communication. Mm -hmm. I'll be right back. My concern is they don't know that I can format this. Mm -hmm. Honestly, appropriately in the next however many minutes. And it won't look that way right in school that. spring as you can probably imagine. Oh, it will be worse. I, mean, I know it's going to sound Do you have a short timeline, not very, but uh, maybe we should slow it down. Oh, that. Just make sure we're uh, yeah, skipping so steps. I was going to say, not if they just dictated what they wanted to do. And... In terms of, well, it's just, yeah. What's that? That will be when they get us crossed up. Cool. David? David over there? Yeah. Well, EM Office Xerox. Where's that going to go? Down to the principal's office. My understanding with internal would be you find someone who can at least temporarily fill the shoes while you go through the hiring process, right? So you wouldn't necessarily need to have a full did you send it? Notice or application. Um, I think it's just went through. Which one is the library here? The rating should be for the full library. I just said that to be on. But the last time we did this <laughs> yes. piece, they may have, I'm not sure about what that looks like. Do we have some right. loss? Yes, but it, it was, it, they were internal people. I'm not sure about the first time. I think I just sent it. Okay, well. So. so I think that's what I'm interested in. Yeah, so libraries, I think it's an option. Uh, when you hit the door, there's still like more. Yeah. Oh, well, there it is. Well, it's printed. Okay. So mine probably printed to this. I'm going to probably on the website. Even in that hurried situation, there's very important details, and it sounds like we're kind of skipping phase one and going right into phase two. And the interim is supposed to be the stop gap so that we can go through phase one through five. Right. But the previous time that even we posted around the superintendent, there was that piece that MASS provided for that initial phase. And now we're saying we're not using them, we're using school spring. So it's going to just shift that focus that way. 
So the information would still need to be the same in terms of seeking candidates, but it would be completely independent. Like they can support and offer advice and make sure that we're dotting I's and crossing T's, but they wouldn't be that catch all for the initial that they were before. To notify interested people interested in interim from their list. So I think the idea around just the flyer is just highlighting the essential pieces that will continue, which is what we talked about, but noting that the dates are subject to be determined and then updating the application process. Um, okay, so I have interim and then re strike three year contract interim. Mm -hmm. And you make other changes on that first page. Just the initials came off. I want to make sure the initials are off of all of the Mm -hmm. Selection criteria in all of these. So she can be vice chair. But oh, she's saying these need to go away. So the full screen, when you close that full screen, all of the things you know, you can let that set up there. It's going to be a lot of copy and paste jobs. Because yeah. this is super pretty for like a little bit of Yeah. So it was designed that way. So school spring is not. User friendly, yes, it just looks different. There's a couple samples in the school room right now for superintendent books and the tea. Clunky looking, too. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't look pretty. There's no pictures in the smile. Black bed Susan. Well, those are gone anyway, so. Yeah. <laughs> but like when Jackie fills it out, she like has to fill out so like a lot of drop boxes. Mm -hmm. Would there, you would still be able to pull all the information from yeah. this flyer, though. Yeah. 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 Anything else on page one? Let me just make sure my name is spelled correctly. <laughs> I have it. P-E-L-L-I-T-I-E-R. E-T-I-E-R. E-T-I-E-R. And can I just be chair instead of chairman? Chair. Do you want to be vice chair or vice chairman? Or vice chairperson. It will be whatever you would like me to be. The rest of it makes sense. Okay. Timeline, we're saying. TBD totally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Except for when it's due. We're going to have to figure out when we're posting and when, when it's due, the application, at least for this part. Mm -hmm. So if we are comfortable with it for today and we can get it posted or by the end of the week, I feel like that's huge. At least it's out. And we just need to determine when we want to have it due by. And what I'm asking is if can we have it be by the end of April? Yes. Mm -hmm. Because you really technically only need two weeks or 10 days or, you know, I'm just, that's not going to catch everybody. Right. So I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm thinking if we have it by April 30th, that if we get it tomorrow, that's five weeks. We had it for six last time mm -hmm. for a full search. So, yeah. And then in the time frame, if we're collecting applications for a search committee, then hopefully they can start to meet and determine mm -hmm. a time frame of when they would like to start reviewing applications and all those things, which would then put us at the end of April, beginning of May. And nominate a chair and get, you know, get their bylaws set. Because you guys had to set up, like, rules of engagement, right? For lack of a better word. Huh? Yeah. So you're saying do April 30th that I have? I just put this on with the chair. Is it chair? Oh, oh no, you're good. I mean, that means I think, yeah. April 30th? Yeah, April 30th, I think. I do. Are you guys comfortable with April 30th, a five week search? Yeah, I think that's plenty of time. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we can extend it if needed, right? Do we want to look at? The 26th as the last Friday in the month. Sure. And then that gives us the next week to start hitting it hard. Okay, I'm good with that. April 26th. Are you guys good with that? Good with it. The 30th is a Tuesday. And I, don't know, I just think of Friday as a deadline. Yeah, sounds good. 
Spanish. So April 26. Is there any possibility to do it up until like um, April, 9th, uh, April 19th? That gives you three weeks. Just curious. Um, I'm just worried that we're, in, if we have it for too short, we may not get candidates. Yeah, is only so two months away from that. April 30th. I don't know. But then June 30th. Oh, I see. Is only two months away. And if it's just, I mean, I hate to say it, if it's just for an interim, <laughs> it kind of gives you a little extra time. And then, you know, Ty can reach out to MAFC if you guys continue to do that. When would this be posted? Would it be this week? I would say we could have it posted as soon as tomorrow, but definitely by the end of the week. All right, so definitely by the 29th, and that would be one, two. Three weeks. Right, I can see the logic with that. Is it also Hmm. So that's positive or not? <laughs> yeah. Or they were saying we wouldn't have anybody here to work and be on the committee because they'd be off. And the other thing to consider is MASC likely has a list. Mm -hmm. They, I think they do. A potential right people who might be interested. That's what it sounds like as far as for interim roles. So you would be able to basically elect. I would say keeping it open a little longer because there could be people that aren't on that list who still pursue an interim, but. It will totally be from scratch. Yeah, I'm not opposed to the 19th. I'm I'm open to whatever. I just I don't want it to be, I don't want it to be so short open. But again, we can extend it if when we go on the 19th and there's not a suitable number of candidates or whatever, we can then extend it. Yes. And how how do we do that? Just extend it on school spring. Yeah, I think you can adjust the deadline and extend it. All right, so let's do that. Let's do the 19th. And that gives us a chance to capitalize on vacation week. Well, just time in general. Yeah. When is vacation? The 15th. Oh, so we would. It'd be the end of the week. End of the week, yeah. And we can't look at anything until, um, until it's closed. Mm -hmm. I say we at the collective we, not us we, <laughs> for clarification. Okay. Um, anything, any other areas on here? Will you um, send us a clean draft of it and we can look at it before we hit? Um... And then application process. We'll just detail that applications are being submitted. To school spring? School spring. Jackie is the contact. And I'd say keep that. Please do not contact school committee members or members of the school administration. Yep. Keep that intact. Okay. And then And then the appointment will be made. We should probably have that. The application, the appointment will be made the week of April 12th. So we need to determine when we want to do that. So do we want to say like May 12th? What do you mean? In this application process, it says on here, the appointment will be made the week of April 12th with the anticipated starting date of July 1. So that's, we had that. Mm -hmm. So we can't just have TBD. That's what I was saying. Like the July one start date needs to remain. Oh, I see. Because they're the selection date. Right. Yeah, I guess May May twelfth is Sunday though. So what it may is that Mother's Day too? So, yeah, we can have the week of May thirteenth. <laughs> Do we need to pick or a the day? week of June thirteenth? I don't care when it is. Can we just list prior to July first? Yeah, because I was, you know, sorry, I was in, going I was to say, once you get your committee, you're going to decide to determine the availability to go through the selection process. 
and you're going to have to schedule public interviews. Mm -hmm. Right. I so okay. So sometime before, prior to yeah, I had listed that as to to be determined as well in terms of the selection. Mm -hmm. So um, just leave the anticipated start date of July first. Mm -hmm. Because I think those two things developing the, the search committee and the posting will happen simultaneously. Yeah, I think, and okay. I think it probably needs to happen before May 20th. Yeah, I think Jen was using that as like the selection date meeting, like the school committee meeting. But we need to have the committee, that this committee needs to be doing the selection. Because if we have a change in committee or we don't have enough committee members, right? So it needs to be locked in before the end of May. Is that what you're saying? It needs to be locked in before the end of May, before Jill's last meeting. Okay. That's. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's still a quorum without Jill, but. I think if Jill's going to participate in this in any way, shape, or form, it would make sense to have her. But that gives a month between when it closes and that date, too. I mean, and I can participate as much or as little as people would prefer to make timelines work. So you maybe wouldn't be the school committee representative. Um, no, I wasn't honestly thinking that I would do that. Right. Just because of the time frame. Mm -hmm. I do. I so I don't even I don't know if that's putting undue pressure on us, but it feels it feels um, to potentially have two new members, and that's assuming I'm going to get voted in. To not to have a brand new committee that hasn't been in on part, any part of it appoint and select the new superintendent doesn't feel right to me. <laughs> Do you, am I reading that wrong? I hear you. I, I mean, I really don't, I don't know what the, I don't know what the real rules are. I don't okay, how the last few elections went. I wouldn't be super concerned. No, we all same. Right. I, I'm not trying to pat myself in the back. I'm assuming I will get reelected, but as it stands right now, no one has pulled papers for the last two spots. Mm -hmm. So we may be faced with a committee of three, which is fine because we still have a quorum. Um, but it is what it is, I guess, at that point. So why don't we, like Jill has been saying right along, we'll leave that TBD. We'll take that part out of the, um, application process and just say a start date of July 1. Okay. So just to formalize it, I would probably take a vote. We've made, we added interim to the superintendent. Piece at the in the header, taking out the three year agreement, added, made Jen chair, made Jill vice chair, corrected the spelling on her name, took off the initials on the selection criteria piece. The timeline will be TBD except the date that it's posted. The date it's posted. The date it closes and the start the date, date that it closes would be April 19th. Everything else is TBD. It's going to go through school spring. The exception of start date. Start date will still remain July 1st. Jackie is the contact. And we'll leave yep, anticipated start date of July 1st. And we'll leave please do not contact school committee members or members of the school administration. And do we need to say like any other? Details that are updated, we'll be able to update just that can count. There's a couple of those. Yep. And we'll account to make sure all the faculty positions are accurate with our current configuration. 
and current budget and yes yeah okay um that's a vote if um you are all amenable to that i will take the motion I'll make the motion to approve the changes on the flyer and move forward with posting. Can I have a second? A second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. So with that said, I'd like to see a clean draft of that. And then um, if everyone can look at it when we get the clean draft, make sure not to reply to all. And then we can, as soon as you've heard from all of us, we can go ahead and get that posted. Yeah? Yep. Okay. So we'll send out a connect ed for committee. I'd also like the committee um, request to go out in the newsletters and we'll have all of those names collected by the 5th so that on our meeting on the 9th, we can try to formalize that. So how do we do that? Will we reach out to them and ask them to come or um, I don't know. We'll just email them from that meeting to say you've been chosen to to appear on the, the committee. Yeah, to appear. Yeah, on the committee. I think we can send an email. Last time we did a survey around people's availability. Um, you know, there's a lot of pieces once being a part of the committee. So, um, you know, you may not choose to be on the committee, but would you sit in on the um, at least? The, that first part to make sure that we conquer all of the pieces for, and give your perspective of what it was like. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, so now we have a decision to make. It is, oh, are we done with this part? I think so. I guess one question I had is would you would the committee like to post the meeting for next Tuesday with superintendent search as a topic after the public hearing? Just even if you don't use the meeting. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that's a great idea. And we can touch base and see if we're getting any information, any, any, anywhere. <laughs> Anybody volunteering, make another plea. That's a great idea, Stephen. Thank you. April 2nd, maybe. So we, the time now is 8.45. We are still, um, we are barely halfway through our agenda because we have work groups. I am wondering, is there, um, can the work group work be pushed to the April 9th meeting? Or do we want to wait until the April whatever it is, 20 something meeting. The uh, April 22nd or 20 something would work better for me because I'm not gonna be here. Yeah. I would just recommend budget and finance and policy probably meet tonight for, mm -hmm. even if it's for 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I totally up to the committee. I just think there's a, obviously the budget and we have a policy that could go to vote for the next meeting. Mm -hmm. I was thinking for the budget that we would be able to talk about it for with his finance and operations report. Um, but all right. Um, so we'll break up into work groups. I don't believe we'll have time for community relations at this point because uh, Mike and I need to be probably focused on the budget. Um, how long do you guys want for policy? I think, you know, we're going to table policy B and any of the other questions and just look at that um, dual enrollment policy. Yeah. Okay. So that shorter time, I think, would be fine. So five after nine, 20 minutes. Okay. We'll break for that. Go to the work groups and then we'll reconvene at that point. Go ahead. can stop. Okay, we're back. Um, first up is policy. Sure. Uh, so we looked over the dual enrollment um, policy itself, just to verify there wouldn't be any conflict with the 
uh, one that Stephen had provided to us. And so it's written pretty generally. So as long as we don't see any issues with what he's written, there's nothing in there to rip it otherwise. And it lines up pretty well for that. So um, bring it for a first read next time. IHBC. Excellent. And then we'll have, um, and then we're, we'll have more work to do for B, right? Because we're not ready for a read on that one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else for you guys? Mm -mm. And budget. Pat, or do you, uh, Mike, do you want to talk about what we talked about? Uh, we just expounded upon what was presented earlier in the day uh, between six and uh, quarter of seven. Um, a lot of brainstorming about potential ways to close that budgetary gap. And uh, honestly, the, the discussion is in progress. There, there's not a definitive answer to closing that budgetary gap at this time. Okay. Uh, any questions on that? I didn't ask, but any questions for policy? All right, superintendent's report. Reminder to folks that the FY25 budget public hearing is next Tuesday, April 2nd at 6.30 here in the East Meadow Library. Um, hopefully we can get some members of the community here. Happy to try to answer questions um, about the budget process. Our intention would be to have the school committee vote that following Tuesday, April 9th. Um, Cole kind of stole this one too, but uh, Math, Mass, the Mass, Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents Award for Academic Excellence. Um, this year's recipient is Cindy Cusimo, and there is a dinner hosted at Pathfinder Regional for um, local recipients. And Ms. Jordan and I will be in attendance um, in recognition of Cindy tomorrow night. I wanted to let the committee know that the MSBA is doing their initial walkthrough for the recommissioning of East Meadow on Monday, April 1st. So that's just their first walkthrough. Um, and then a reminder to folks that there is no school this Friday, April 29th. I'm sorry, March 29th. Um, <laughs> and then we will be sharing guidelines out. The Massachusetts Department of Public Health provided new guidelines regarding um, respiratory infections. I think they're alluding to COVID there. Um, but we will try to provide a pared down version, but essentially um, it is saying that if you have not had a fever in the last 24 hours without the use of fever reducing medicines and your symptoms, other symptoms are improving, you um, can attend school, but we will, like I said, provide more guidance in the coming days on that. And that's all I have. Any questions for Steven? Todd, you're up. Um, I don't have anything much more to add other than our budget presentation and being prepared for on next Tuesday's uh, public hearing. Um, there was a request at our last meeting around some of our regular day transportation. I did reach out to the local manager and the regional manager regarding uh, the disruption to our regular transportation. The local manager talked about um, shortage of drivers um, and Trainees are in the works. Um, I have not heard back yet from the regional manager. We got a credit back for That's services. That's why I'm reaching out to the regional manager is to see if there's some credit to our invoices based on missed runs. So it's all that I have. Uh, how are we with the kitchen? Um, I had a phone call and then couple of exchanges with one of the engineers at the end of the week um, really set kind of the parameters of what they're they're doing um, for the kitchen and that wing um, so we're waiting on next steps from them. Excellent. Any questions for Tess? Jill? Maybe tomorrow for CS. Thanks. All right so for um, we have next week which is the public um, hearing and then we'll also have a 
tag up on superintendent search. And then the next meeting, do we feel like we need to have another work group meeting to get um, to do community relations and possibly policy, uh, especially community relations? I'm thinking sort of tagged up with budget. We could probably have a dual pronged approach for that to try to get people out, make sure we get the word out about the vote uh, and everything. I know it'll be after the public hearing, but still sort of in the throes of it. So because we would then we would have that. Do we want to have that one? that first meeting in April or wait until the later April meeting, which I think we said earlier was the 22nd. Um, just wonder, what do you guys think? George said you, will, you won't be here on the 9th. Sure. Is everyone else planning to be here on the 9th? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because uh, we, if we are down more than two, we can't have a meeting because we won't have one. Um, I'm April 23rd. Say it again. April 23rd. Actually. Oh, April 23rd. Okay. Um, anything else that we want to make sure is on the next agenda? Next two agendas? So, um, it was April 9th and April 23rd, right? Those yeah. Are also yeah. April 2nd? April 2nd. We have the public hearing and just superintendent search on an agenda. Okay. Uh, 630, right? Yes. 630 and then the I'm assuming superintendent search we'd probably close for I mean, 7.30. Yeah, I do 7. It's better to start late than to have to wait. Didn't we decide on some work groups for next? Well, yeah, what do we want to do for work groups? Do we want to have one on the 9th or wait until the 22nd? Third. I'm fine with whatever people are comfortable with, because even if I'm, you know, just working, it's there's still work to do. All right, so why don't we, um, since we have a little bit of time, because we have next week and we have the posted part of the super search, we can reevaluate at that point to see what we want to have on the following meeting. Does that sound good with everybody? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, anything else? All right. I'm going to vote to enter into executive session under Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 21, Part A3, to discuss strategy with regard to collective bargaining, as doing so in an open session may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the committee. The committee will not return to open session. Would you a roll call, please? Absolutely. Mr. Durham? Aye. Mr. Belke? Aye. Ms. Pelletier? Aye. Ms. Bartos? Aye. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.